All right, without further ado, let's go to our series today. Uh, let's pray one more time, shall we, as we look to our Father to speak to us from His Word. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word is true and that your grace is sufficient for us even as we look into these words. We pray that, Lord, you would take our eyes off, off of the things that are distracting us and more importantly, the hearts that is restless, prone to wonder. Lord, we feel it. And we need your spirit to come and captivate our hearts and our minds to see on some glorious and wonderful, important truths, truths that can change our lives once and for all. And we thank you today that your spirit is present to point us to the beauty, the magnificency of Jesus Christ, who is supreme over our suffering, who is the Lord of the universe, uh, whom we are called to know deeply, intimately, and make him known. And so come, speak to us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Sorry, could we? Do you guys hear some noise? I think last Sunday, Kumi went and asked them to turn it off. Okay. Yeah, I think it will be nice. And also this thing is super loud. I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is. Yeah. Was it like that last week? I thought it was soft. Anyway, it maybe it's just my head. I'm really distracted, sorry. All right. Let's uh, look to our text today, Grace for the Suffering Flock. 1 Peter 5, 1 to 11. 1 Peter 5, 1 to 11. Okay, so my question to you is, what have you learned about humility during the pandemic? This is a very important topic. Humility is not an easy topic to preach. Humility, preaching, is very interesting, right? So, but it's also important for the Christian life. What have you learned about humility during the pandemic? Uh, how many of you know that pride can make suffering much harder? I know in my personal life, when I have suffered, my pride makes things harder, makes things harder for my wife and for everyone else. Pride can make things harder, but uh, humility can make things lighter, right? So, pride can make things harder, humility can make things lighter. So here Peter closes his letter by addressing the flock of God who are suffering in Asia Minor. And so here are three insights we're going to see again on the relationship between God's grace and humility in our suffering. Number one, humility serves by example. Humility serves by example. Number two, humility casts all anxieties on God. Humility casts all anxieties on God. Number three, humility looks to God's restoring grace. Humility looks to God's restoring grace. So number one, humility serves by example. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfailing crown of glory. This is addressing to me, and it is not an easy text to preach, but it is the Word of God, and I have to preach it. Now, notice how Peter calls himself a fellow elder. There is humility in his words, right? Uh, this is remarkable because Peter is one of the original apostles, and yet he calls him a fellow elder. He comes alongside the elders of the church and says, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder. Do you see, he says, uh, elders, plural, among you, 
And so at the Bridge Fellowship, really, we seek to be led by a plurality of elders. Um, and so who are the elders here? He's not saying older people who are old in age are automatically qualified to be elders. That's not true. Or even younger men can't be elders. That's not what he's saying. When he says elders, he's talking about men qualified by spiritual character and calling according to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus as well. But what do elders do? Notice he says in verse 2, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Notice it says that is among you. By the way, this is not, not, in, not uh, this is kind of like, let me just add this quickly. It's very important. He says, among you, it implies that, that local church is important, that the sheep are among them. They're not wandering around and going to different churches whenever they want. They are among them, and so are the shepherds. The shepherds are not going to other churches wherever they want. <laughs> I'm not a shepherd in another church down there in Shibuya. I'm a shepherd of this church. You are the flock of God in this church. I'm among the flock, and he's going to say down there that Jesus Christ is the chief shepherd. So it is very important that he's talking about the sheep, the flock of God that is among you. And elders shepherd the sheep, the flock of God that are among them. And so, shepherd means tending, it's a verb there, a feeding, caring, leading, guiding, and protecting the flock of God. Protecting the flock from wolves and even from the lion, as we will see down there later. Remember, in John 21, when Jesus appeared to Peter, he said, feed my sheep. And so, Peter himself had become a shepherd an elder, a pastor by this time. So, which flocks are elders called to care for? Notice that word. The flock that is among you, he says. Not the sheep that is in another church, but among you. The sheep that are in another church, the elders there are responsible for them, and vice versa, right? Peter is saying elders, even potential ones, are the ones willing to shepherd the flock. And he says, not under compulsion or obligation, but willingly as God would have you. Not as you would have, but as God would have you according to his word. The elders derive their authority from the word of God, not outside of God's word. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly, he says. What is shameful gain? Now, Shameful gain means devouring the flock, using the flock to get rich and get fat, using the flock to gain power, wealth, prestige, position, reputation, right? And so, thank you. Uh, this reputation uh, uh, and this gaining power, prestige, and money, that, and greed, he says, that's what shameful gain is. He says, that's what brings shame in their conscience, right? He says in verse 3, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Now, uh, if you look at uh, the word domineering, what does that word domineering mean? See, it means not lording over others. It means it's the idea of this person ruling over the weak person right? Ruling, that's what he means. Remember that Peter is writing to believers who were oppressed under the authoritarian leadership style of the Romans. Uh, many people in the workplace today experience power harassment, many of you know that, which results in bullying from the boss and that kind of thing. Because under a domineering spirit is the idol of power. And mind you, this is a warning not only to the elders. The assumption is that anybody in the church, if they are domineering, disqualify themselves to be in any kind of leadership positions. That is the underlying uh, assumption here, right? The, the underlying implication. You can't be domineering, right? The Pharisees in Jesus' day often lorded over, it, over others so that they may gain honor and power over others. And remember that Peter would have known what Ezekiel said in Ezekiel 34, where Ezekiel was speaking to the false shepherds and he said this, You have ruled them harshly and brutally, so they were scattered because there was no shepherd. Israel at the time did not have true shepherd. 
And Peter was there when Jesus said in Mark 10, 42, I quote, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles, namely the Romans at the time, lord it over them, and the great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And this is what Peter says here. Not domineering, but being examples to the flock. See, Peter is saying elders lead by example. They set types and patterns for others to follow, in, including in servanthood, servanthood, right? Mainly to servanthood. Jesus set as an example for his disciples when he took up a towel to serve. He didn't come to get, gain wealth, reputation, and power over his disciples. He came to serve. He took up a towel. This is sacrificial example. This is sacrificial servanthood. And so, where can we get that kind of power to serve? Where does that humility to serve come from? Where does humble willingness and eagerness come from? What is the motivation behind it? The motivation is not gaining reputation. The motivation is not gaining wealth, position, prestige, or making a name for yourself. The, the motivation here is very important. Look at what Peter said in verse 1. He is a witness of the sufferings of Christ. That's the motivation. Peter had seen Jesus' example of washing the disciples' feet, but that was not enough. He saw more than that. This is very important. He saw... Christ suffering on the cross for his sin. He was an eyewitness of the sufferings of Christ. In the greatest act of servanthood, Jesus laid down his life for his sheep. That's what motivated Peter. Jesus emptied himself in selfless service on the cross. This is what Peter saw, right? He's a witness of the sufferings of Christ. And he says, I'm also a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. So he says to the elders in verse 4, When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So the elders receive their rewards not here on earth. Yes, they shepherd the flock. They wait for the return of Jesus Christ, the chief shepherd of the church, who will reward them when he returns. And so next we see, humility casts all anxieties on God. Humility casts all anxieties on God. If you are struggling with chronic anxiety, this text is for you. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourself, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time, he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. After he finished telling the elders not to be domineering, now he talks to the younger people. And uh, that is us here, right? He's talking to the younger men. It was very common in those days for older men who are mature in years to be elders in the church because their marriages and their character have been tested over time according to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and therefore they have been affirmed by the church as elders and younger men were serving under them and he says younger here means younger in the faith and also in age right he says likewise you who are younger be subject to the elders be submitted that's what it means remember this is very important in chapter 2, 13, Peter had said, be subject to what? Be subject to every human institution for the Lord's sake. And there in verse 18, he says, servants, be subject to your masters with all respect. Sorry. In chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Wives, be subject to your own husbands. So from chapter 2, we have been seeing this theme of submission. And finally here, he says in the church, Likewise, you who are younger, be submitted to the elders. 
Peter shows how the gospel changes these relationships, right? He says, be subject to human institution. How you relate to the government changes now by the gospel. He says, uh, be subject to your masters. How you relate to your boss in the workplace changes. In chapter 3, he says, wives, be subject to your own husband. How you relate in, to one another in the home changes. Now, in the church, how you relate to your elders changes. He says, he tells the younger sheep to submit to the elder shepherd who are above them now why is submission so hard uh, the context is very helpful right when interpreting the text because Peter here is addressing pride notice he says God opposes proud the proud pride makes submission very hard remember this is in the context of suffering that's why I was telling you pride makes our suffering harder Pride makes submission hard. It was out of pride that Adam failed to submit to God. It was because of pride that God, Adam, kicked out, on the, out of the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Blessing, and brought the curse, right? Remember, the believers here were suffering under the Roman Empire, under severe duress, under hardships and persecutions. And the persecutions by this time were starting to increase. In a time of stress, see, there's a lot of external pressures that they were suffering, much like we are having right now during COVID-19. See, there's pride in youthfulness that says, I know better. I know better. See, it's very, very dangerous. Pride always makes us wiser than we actually are. <laughs> you know, this is painful because uh, as a young man, I don't have time. I don't want to waste this text for you. I can tell you stories of how many stupid decisions I've made in the past before I became a Christian. It was drastic. And some of you may be wiser than me, and if that's you, bless you. But I made incredibly rebellious, prideful, stupid mistakes that pierce me with lots of consequences that I don't even want, don't have time to talk about. Okay, so pride is unwilling to submit see, and seeks to dominate and that's the thing. See, none of us ever since the fall, we want to dominate, we want to be in control, not submit, right? We want to be domineering over others. We want to have the last say. We want to have the final say. We want to be the one who sets the course of uh, the human race and, and politics. And, and, and this is how the society should run and things. And we may even have the correct answers. And that's the scary part about pride. Is that we may have the correct answers to them. And not see the pride that is in us. And that is the humbling thing about pride. Right? See, th this is very important. Uh, pride can create strife, frictions, and even divisions in the church. Anytime you see division, go and look for pride. You will always find it. Anytime. It doesn't matter what's the issue. So people will talk about external issues as though that's the most important thing. But beneath that surface is pride driving it and creating frictions and 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 fights and divisions and this was especially tempting in a time when they were under pressure under the Roman Empire right and I know this at least as a as your pastor the slow progress of the gospel in Japan has humbled me greatly many times in the past you know I've been here 17 years and my young pride wants to make things faster Right? Speed up the process, control how the church should run, control the bridge fellowship, control how you know, the church should head. You know? uh, and when it doesn't happen, I get frustrated and even angry. Right? That has happened to me in the past so many times. And I see, I see younger men, like very passionate from around the world come. This has happened in 17 years. And my wife will tell you, I don't have time to mention names and we don't want to do that. But I see like zeal and passion for mission. And then they're, they're, they have great ideas, but their life here on Japan is short. I've seen many missionaries go back home with great discouragements because they have vision for Japan, thinking they're going to come and change Japan. And the reality is it's so steadily slow and painful. It's eating them away, the rhythms of Japanese society and the cultural challenges is massive with one percent of Christian population and 99 percent of the people haven't heard the gospel things are not moving as fast as they want and they get discouraged and they quit I'm thinking if only you were patient and humbled yourself 
like Christ emptied himself and entered into the cultural world of Judaism to take time to learn the language, to learn the people. I took two years of language lesson and I'm still so I still so suck at it, I can't even te preach to you in Japanese language. Oh goodness, grief! The Lord has been merciful. Any salvation we have seen has been nothing that I added. It has been because of God's mercy and grace in this church. So I've been humbled. So enough of me. They were tested by various fiery trials as we have seen in chapter 1 and chapter 4. And pride can make our trials harder. It has made it harder for many missionaries. And let me just say that again. Uh, this is not a course on missions, but it has implications. I've had missionaries who stayed here, uh, mentors who stayed here for 30 years, and they've just begun to see the fruit of their ministries. And they have been patient, they have been discouraged. You heard Dan Iverson, right? 30 years of being here. And now he's starting to see their church and their denomination multiply. But it took years. Cool, sure, every year the Bridge Fellowship has seen uh, baptisms. <laughs> profession of faith. <laughs> That's a miracle. Do you realize Dan Iverson didn't see any conversion in his first four years? We are talking about the reality of how God works here in his sovereignty is at work, but he's at work. And so it's important to learn humility. Pride can make our trials harder. So he says, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. He says, clothe yourselves, the image here is of an apron of a servant, right? Servants wear an apron. It's a sign of humility. See, put on humble attitude, all of you, he says, toward one another. How many of you know? Humility beautifies relationships, but pride destroys relationships. How many of you know humility ties together relationships? The language there is an apron. When you wear an apron, you have to tie it around you. Humility ties relationships together. Pride breaks relationships and creates stripes and divisions. He says God is literally opposed to pride. Why? You can see how Adam got himself kicked out because pride is at the root of all sin. C.S. Lewis says pride is the mother of all sin. Every time you see sin, behavioral sins of all kinds, sins of the heart, go and check it out. There will be pride. God is opposes, opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Now, do you see the connection between humility and submission to the elders? The connection in this context is unmistakable. But it's humbling because it means you have to follow imperfect elders, <laughs> right? It's very humbling because if, if, the, if the elders, church elders were really perfect, then it would, oh yeah, you're inspired to follow easily, it's natural, it's attractive, it's beautiful. And hopefully they will grow too. But the idea here is that you're called to follow imperfect elders and it's humbling. It takes humility to do that, right? God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. It's giving yourself under their care, the care of the elders, the nurture, the guidance, the feeding, and the leading. And Peter says this is good for you. Notice how Peter takes from Proverbs 3.34. He says God opposes. Literally he sets himself against the proud but he gives grace to the humble. The NIV translation says, He mocks proud mockers, but he shows favor to the humble and the oppressed. It's amazing. God himself is so attracted to humility, he finds pride repulsive. So this is important for Peter's readers, right? Because humility was seen in Greco-Roman culture as a mark of a slave, right? The Romans, it was unappealing when Christians were humil humble, right? Because humility was a mark of a slave. It's a sign of weakness. Because in Roman culture, it's all about the strong eat the weak. The strong climbs to the top of the ladder, right? The powerful climb on top of the ladder. And all the weak and all the humble people are trampled upon. The, you know, you step your foot, you set your foot on top of the other person in a world of ambition. And it is true for us as well today. C.S. Lewis said, a proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you are looking down, you cannot see anything that is above you, he says. The way to know if there is pride in your heart is to become self-aware and see when you talk, when you talk about things, 
Is there a condescending attitude? Is there like looking down on things and on people? Is that a general posture of your heart? Is that looking down on the Japanese culture? Right? Very important. Like who are we to come in here and look down on our Japanese brothers and sisters? I have no right to be in this nation. They can kick me out anytime they want. Right? And therefore, it is very important that when we enter into this kind of situations, we put on humility. And it is attractive to the Lord. Peter says in verse 6, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, because so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him, because He cares for you. Can you imagine being opposed by the mighty hand of God? See, how many of you know that in difficult relationships, like somebody, a proud person opposes you? How many of you know it's uncomfortable, right? Some really obnoxious proud person comes and, and pushes you around in your workplace or in your homes or in your neighborhoods or in wherever in public sectors where you interact with people. And they push you around and they talk over you and they come and it's, they're all over you, right? And they push you around and they tell you to do this and that and they, and they boss you around and there's pride driving that. How many of you know it's, it's uncomfortable? You feel weak already. You feel so vulnerable, right? But now take it to the next level. God opposes the proud. The sovereign mighty hand of God that he talks about here that can crush sinners opposes the proud. A holy and mighty God. No one can say, what are you doing with your mighty hand? He is sovereign. He is the Lord of the universe. He created the universe. It's his universe. No one can say, why did you kill those people? Because some people ask this kind of questions like, how can God kill people? My answer is, why not? It's his universe. If your government can destroy sin, uh, evil people who are killing other evil pe uh, others, uh, innocent people in your country, if your government has the authority and the power to do it, why not a sovereign God, a mighty hand of God? He can do whatever he wants. Of course he can do whatever he wants. If you own a house and somebody comes into your house and tries to hurt your family, you can do whatever you want to defend yourself. Why not God? He's a God of justice. His justice is much more powerful than anyone and any government can comprehend. He's the mighty hand of God. I get excited about this stuff because he's God. That's it. He's God. He's big. He's mighty. He's sovereign. He's the Lord of the universe. He writes history. Incredible. He does whatever he wants. In the Old Testament it says, He raises up king, he throws them down. Oh my goodness. To punish the, Israel, the rebellious Israelites, he raises up an enemy king. Oh my goodness. To bring discipline on the nation of Israel, we are dealing with an incredible massive God. And if he opposes me and he pushes me down, I can never climb up even if he as long as his hand will not be taken away from me the reason this is so important is because the same mighty hand of God is also able to raise up the lowly and the humble God opposes the proud but he gives grace to the humble right he lifts up the humble those who humble themselves under his mighty hand See, humility looks to the mighty hand of God that can raise us up or push us down. The mighty hand of God can humble us or exalt us. Humility submits to the mighty hand of God. It comes under the mighty hand of God that can oppose you or exalt you. The mighty hand of God that puts down the proud is also the mighty hand that exalts the humble. And you should be glad. That you are a child of God. He is able to exalt you. That's the grace that God gives to the humble. He says God gives grace to the humble. What grace does he give? He lifts up the humble. In incredible, right? And he says, notice, God's hand had humbled Israel as a nation. Many times over, Peter knew this. And Peter who pridefully, remember Peter was really proud at one point, And he said, if all the disciples deny you, I will not deny you. He was quite cocky. Yeah, And then he was tested. When Jesus was arrested, he was hiding and he denied Jesus Christ. The person who said, I will never deny you, is the one who was hiding and cowering in fear. And therefore, Jesus had come and humbled him and restored him. And he loves him. 
and now he's a shepherd in the church and he's telling the church humble yourselves don't be a cocky guy like me <laughs> he says humble yourselves under the mighty hand of god he had learned a hard lesson and so god uses opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble which would you prefer today i pray that we will choose humility especially in these times peter says so that look at the promise here at the proper time he may exalt you now okay how many of you know that god's timing and your time are different notice the language the proper time there is a proper time the proper time here is not your time it was not the time for the those people yet they were going to suffer persecution uh, the proper time is not your time the proper time is god's time god has a clock the world runs with his clock okay so here is what happens let me ask you this question think think with me what happens when you try to control god's time <laughs> okay what happens when you try to speed up God's time? You feel anxious. Right? He addresses anxieties. Because beneath our anxieties is an idol of control. When you try to control what only the mighty hand of God can control, what happens? I'm not talking about the daily stuff of things that you do in your daily life that you are you are indeed in control of those little things but like God stuff like how the church should move forward and how this nation should be changing and stuff when you talk about the mighty hand of God only he can do those things only he can control those things and so when we try to push it what happens we get so anxious we get so anxious because why we're trying to play God we're trying to be something that we're not trying to be we're trying to be God, take his place and control of things. That's idolatry. Anxiety here means distress in view of possible danger or misfortune. Anxiety, worry, anxious concern. That's what it means. I know, let me say this sympathetically, I know the waiting period can be painfully slow, right? He says, at the proper time, there's suffering. <laughs> and then he says, at the proper time, he will exalt you. This must have been comforting to those who were suffering. God's time is the proper time in which he comes to lift up the anxieties, the suffering, the anxious people, the persecuted, the oppressed, and the humble. And so what time is it in God's clock at the moment? This is important. Some of us here are like that kid. How many of you know that kid who sits at the back of the car and you're driving maybe in the west and then she says, Are we there yet, mommy? <laughs> are we there yet? <laughs> but you're, dr you're driving, you're driving. Adults are the same. Adults are the same. We want to be on the driver's seat, but in the things that only God can drive. We want to control what only the mighty hand of God can control. And we are like, are we there yet, God? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? We're impatience. There's impatience growing in the waiting period. And so we get anxious on the journey. But Peter says, notice here is good news in verse 7. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. How many of you know that when you go and take all your anxieties and you try to pour it out all on one person like your friend, your, your friend feels so overwhelmed <laughs> because your friend also has her own anxieties. <laughs> she can only handle so much. You know, maybe when she's not anxious, she can take a little bit. But if you berail her every day, she's going to be so overwhelmed, you see? But this same principle applies when he says, casting all your anxieties on God, the mighty hand of God that can take away your anxieties. Because why? He cares for you. He is your father. We have a father, as the song says. He cares for you, Peter says. Look, humility casts all anxieties on God, who is able to lift up your anxieties. Humility looks to, the God, to God's mighty hand who is able to give you grace at the proper time. Humility waits for God's proper time to exalt you because he cares for you. See, humility is relaxing. You guys, you're sitting, you're relaxing right now, you're so chill. If you have humility in your heart, you will be as relaxed like that. It's like you're sitting under God's care. He cares for you. You sit under his care. You are free from anxiety because humility cast it upon him. And so humility is relaxing. Humble people are relaxed. 
They have nothing to prove to you. They have nothing to prove to the world anymore. They are relaxed. They do whatever they do for the mighty hand of God in view, with the mighty hand of God in view. They are the most relaxing people. He says, humility casts all, all anxieties on God who cares for you. I need this. You need this. And so finally we see, humility looks to the God of all grace. Sorry, humility looks to God's strengthening grace. God's strengthening grace. How many of you know you need this, right? Um, I'm running out of voice. Esther, could you please read this out loud for us, quickly? Amen. What a beautiful verse. How many of you know that when you're anxious, you're vulnerable to satanic schemes, yeah? Quite vulnerable. Because when you're anxious, that's a good distraction. Peter says in verse 8, be sober-minded, therefore. See, sober-minded is free from anxiety. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Look, a sober mind is humbly at rest. A sober mind is humbly addressed on God who cares for you. See, the real enemy of Christians were not only the Romans at that time. There was a greater enemy behind it. He was called the devil himself. A far more dangerous enemy. Your greatest enemy is not people. Your greatest enemy is the devil. In Matthew 16, 23, this happened. Right after Jesus said he was going to the cross, Peter tried to stop Jesus, right? And Jesus replied, what? Do you remember what he said? Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. Peter comes around. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. He had experienced what it means to be harassed by the enemy. And he says, seeking someone to devour. And see, Satan is likened to a roaring lion for seeking, looking for someone to devour. Now, how many of you know, like, when you're really hungry, super hungry, and you come and then, uh, you like, Natalie, you like uh, chicken curry, right? And you like, you devour that thing. That's the language. And, like, you eat it, like, you, you hog, and like, you gulp everything down because you're super hungry, right? And so the image here is like a hungry lion who is seeking to devour, <laughs> you know, it's incredible, it's seeking to devour, it's seeking, devour means to destroy literally, to eat you all up. That's all Satan cares about. He's seeking to destroy a community of faith. Like a lion, he's roaming around seeking a weak sheep. You hear that, Adelaide? Satan is like a roaming, roaring lion, he's seeking a weak sheep. The teeny weeny sheep, the one that is isolated from the flock of God. The little lamb, the cute little lamb that runs astray. That's the one that the enemy comes looking for, right? See, look, in the Old Testament, the figure of a lion appears in several places to talk about the enemies of Israel. Incredible. Uh, and here, I'll show you in a minute. Peter alludes specifically, among other places, from... Uh, Psalm 22 and it says, Psalm 22 again by the way is a messianic chapter and it says, Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan, the old king of Bashan, right, uh, surround me. They open wide their mouths, like, look at that, like a ravening and roaring lion, right. The psalmist is talking about savage human opponents, not the devil himself even here. He says his enemies are like a ravening and roaring lion. And many times we see Satan will use human adversaries, evil regimes, and even, even empires, right? So Peter here says that his readers had seen, in his mind, his readers had seen roaring lions rip apart human flesh in the Roman amphitheater. And a time was soon coming when Christian leaders like Ignatius, the early church leader, who would be devoured by lions in the Roman Colosseum, so Peter says in verse 9, resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being ex experienced by a brotherhood throughout the world. 
<coughs> See, to resist Satan, he says, humble yourselves. Cast all your anxieties on God who cares for you. Be sober-minded, right? Be watchful. Be alert for the seductions of Satan to deceive the church. This is important, right? Because one of Satan's favorite tactics, by the way, is to let people believe that he doesn't exist. Right? Because it's very easy for Christians to go about our day. Our, our, our lives are driven by what we see, the visible. We don't walk by faith. We don't think that, you know, the enemy is actually there. Yeah, by the way, especially in this mission field, right? He's there. He's real. And he's always at work. He's super busy. Right? He never sleeps. He's always at work. And he roams around. That's the picture here. He roams. He's like endlessly looking for someone to devour. Because, see, it's very important. He wants us to believe that he is, he does not exist. And it's very hard for modern people who believe in science and only what, what they can see, taste, touch and see, right? To, to believe that such a supernatural being exists. And that's exactly what the enemy wants. To let them believe. That's the greatest lie he has been able to pull. Jesus said Satan is the father of lies. That's the greatest lie he's been able to pull. Is to let people believe in their minds that he doesn't exist. That he's just a myth and some old fairy tale that Christians believe. That these are things that modern scientific people with their rational mind don't believe. That we who are educated, oh, all of those fairy tales that were written in the, old in the New Testament times, we don't believe that anymore. That's the argument of uh, liberal Christianity. Uh, Satan is just a myth. And so uh, P Christians try, uh, are brought into this peacetime mentality and not a wartime mentality. And in Revelation 12, 10, the devil is called the accuser of the brethren. He is the accuser of Christians. He shoots fiery darts to accuse you in your mind. That's why Peter says, be sober-minded, right? Like a lion seeking sheep to devour here, the images is, he creeps up behind them, he slowly and quietly, he's a masterful at hunting, looking to pounce suddenly, he's good at stealth. That's the lion, right? He's the unseen enemy, but Peter says resist him, firm in your faith. So how do you stay firm in your faith? How do you resist him? That word firm means strong, immovable, solid. Remember earlier in chapter 2, 5, Peter had said, you yourselves are like living stones being built up as a spiritual house. In other words, your faith is built upon Christ, the cornerstone, in whom you can stand firm. That's what makes your faith firm. And Peter says, knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. He tells the suffering Christians, you are not alone. As you suffer various trials, don't fall into self-pity and think, we are the only ones. Oh, poor us here, isolated in Asia Minor province. No, around the world at that time. There were other Christians that were suffering. He tells them, your trials are refining your faith. Your trials are, are strengthening your faith. Your trials is making you firm in Jesus Christ. And this is true for us today as well. You are not alone in your sufferings. No suffering that you are going through is uncommon. Your brothers and sisters, your worldwide family of God are experiencing sufferings, the same sufferings, perhaps even worse. In China, in India, in Brazil, in different parts of the world. But he says in verse 10, After you have suffered a while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. He says, this is for a little while. That must have been good news. In humility, look to the God of all grace. Look humbly to him who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ. As a believer, all of your trials and sufferings are not for nothing because God in his grace has called you to his eternal glory in Christ. Look to the God of all grace who will restore you. If you are anxious, he will restore you. If you are hurting and suffering, he will restore you. He will confirm you. He will strengthen you and establish you, he says, because earlier in Peter, and I close with this, when the chief shepherd appears, remember, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. He tells the elders he will reward you with eternal glory, the unfading crown of glory. 
Jesus, the chief shepherd, wore the crown of thorns so that we might receive the unfading crown of glory. Every earthly crown, how many of you know, fades with time. It just fades with time. You can't wear your earthly crown forever. The Roman crown has faded. And only the crown that Jesus will give will last forever and ever. It is unfading in glory. See, in God's own time, the chief shepherd will surely appear. And when he appears, you will be lifted up to share his glory. That is the eternal inheritance, the glory that you and I will share with Jesus. He says the God of all grace will give you the grace to stand firm. And the God of all grace will restore you and confirm you. He will strengthen and establish you in the faith. If you have a need for healing and wounds that you are carrying, oh, He will restore everything. He will surely restore you. And not only us, by the way, He will make all things new. He will restore all the brokenness that is around us. And those who are of the household of faith will be there when He does those things in the new heavens and in the new earth. He will strengthen you by His grace. He will establish you by His grace. And so verse 11 says, to him, to him be dominion forever and ever. This is King Jesus who sits upon his throne as we saw. This is the one we are waiting for. This is the one, Peter says, that he is the one who has the mighty hand. He is the one who sits upon his throne ruling and governing and reigning above all authorities, principalities, powers of this earth. He is King Jesus. When the chief shepherd appears, you too will reign in glory with him. That is the destiny of the church. Jesus Christ has promised, I will build this church, and this gate, the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. He crushed Satan on the cross. Therefore, the enemy cannot prevail against his church. Would you stand as we close in prayer?